Hello, everyone. I am joined by Dr. Henry Anyamedu. He is an infectious disease specialist. He's been on our programs before, and he's with the Hospital of Central Connecticut. We thank you for joining us now as we can get an update on how this virus may be changing a little. Thank you for having me. So what are some of the new symptoms you're seeing with COVID-19? So uh, we are seeing a lot of things that are changing. So some of the cardinal symptoms of COVID-19 that we know already are fever, uh, shortness of breath, and cough. But more and more patients are presenting with gastrointestinal symptoms, which includes uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Uh, we are also seeing patients that are coming in with neurological symptoms, including headaches, uh, dizziness, and even sometimes strokes will be a presenting symptom. Uh, we've also seen that uh, patients can present with conjunctivitis. And again, we're seeing the patients can present with chest pain being the initial symptoms. Although most of these patients will end up having fever uh, sometime along the course of the illness. But these are some of the new symptoms that we are seeing with COVID-19. So when you say conjunctivitis, you mean like pink eye or even stomach aches. A lot of people suffer from IBS. How do you think people can sort this out to know if they need a COVID test? So it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to differentiate between uh, a stomach ache from eating something or a stomach ache from uh, COVID-19. But yes, we've seen patients who have come in with just abdominal pain, and we've seen patients who have come in with conjunctivitis as well, as you rightly said, pink eye. So when you're having any of these symptoms, I think it's appropriate to talk to your clinician or your uh, primary care physician and discuss with them whether you need uh, testing, because it would be very important if you have COVID-19 to isolate yourself. There's also now some concern about toilets and public restrooms. Tell us about that. Uh, so uh, we are seeing uh, some concern with toilets and I think gastroenterologists around the world are getting concerned about this as well. So we know that uh, people who have COVID-19 can shed the virus in their stools. And there's a study that came out of Hong Kong that said the people who have COVID-19 can shed the virus even throughout the whole course of the illness and sometimes even after the illness. And we do also know that uh, toilets can be aerosolizing. So if, you, if someone who has COVID-19 uh, uses the bathroom and flushes the toilet, they can aerosolize some of the virus uh, in the vicinity of the toilet on the surfaces. So it's, it's, it's becoming very important that we continue to clean these surfaces very well. And one of the things that I encourage people to do is to wash their hands before going into the bathrooms and wash out when they are coming out of the bathroom. So you wash in and you wash out. And I think we should all begin to appreciate the fact that uh, toilets can be uh, a means of transmission of COVID-19. All right, we're gonna definitely have to be considerate of that. What about if you've had the virus? Do you think now, based on what you know, if you've had the virus, can you continue to get it again or are you immune? So that's uh, a recurring question that we, we've all trying to understand whether uh, immunity to the virus can be lifelong or can last for a short period of time. We know from SARS, uh, the original SARS and MERS, that people can have immunity for up to two to three years after getting SARS or getting MERS. So we are hoping that with uh, COVID-19, uh, people can have immunity as well. But that said, there was a study that came out of China again that said that patients who had a mild symptoms, about 30% of those uh, patients did not have any uh, significant immunity to the, uh, to the virus after having, uh, having their symptoms resolved. So yes, we are hoping that we would all have immunity if you get infected. But at this point, it's not guaranteed. What if you've already had the virus? We're talking about immunity certificates that could lead people to go back to work. Could you still transmit it to people even if you're over it? 
So we know the transmission of COVID-19, it's usually uh, pre-symptomatic, as in before you have the symptoms, during the symptoms, uh, uh, and then sometimes immediately after, uh, after having the symptoms. Yes, uh, people have isolated the virus uh, up to about eight days to 30 days after patients uh, have recovered from the symptoms. But what we don't fully understand is whether uh, these viruses are viable virus because most of the test that is done is molecular uh, test and it's not uh, actually culturing the virus. So people can continue to shed the virus even after they've had the illness, but we don't understand it fully whether they can transmit viable virus to people. So if you have immunity and you've been cleared by your physician to go back to work, I'm hoping that you wouldn't uh, still be actively sh shedding a uh, 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 viable virus that can transmit the virus to someone else. Because we don't know how long they could be shedding the virus. So what does all this mean, the new information that we're seeing with this virus? What do you think this should mean for social distancing? I think we should continue to social distance. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I know that there are people and all of us are getting tired of social distancing uh, and uh, I'm hoping that we would end or at least relax social distancing in some way, form or shape. But while I can tell you when social distancing can end, I think I can tell you some of the indicators that should inform our decision to uh, relax or end social distancing. And some of them includes uh, widespread testing. We really need uh, widespread, uh, widespread testing capabilities, which, in, which includes molecular testing as well as uh, serology testing. We also need to be able to test patients and uh, do contact tracing, surveillance, and some form of humane isolation. We also need to scale up our hospital capacities uh, as well as supplies, or, or hospital supplies, including PPEs. We would also need some form of reliable treatments uh, as well as vaccine. Uh, so while all these things are very important uh, to relax or end social distance, and I, I don't think we are there yet, to end social distancing and any attempt, I believe that any attempt to end social distancing at this point will be an attempt to sacrifice human life. Right, we even have some people on Facebook left right now saying, and we do get these questions. We have the people who are uh, afraid to open the economy back up and want to continue the social distancing. Um, and then we do get comments like we have one right now from someone saying, why should we be afraid of a virus that can be ki killed with soap and water. Could you explain to the people who are perhaps resistant to continue this way why it's important? So uh, I, I think people need to understand that we are dealing with a virus that is, or we're dealing with a virus that's invisible. And this virus is very infectious. It's nothing like, uh, it's nothing like uh, influenza virus that we know of. And we know the people in the community do not have immunity to the virus. So getting infected with this COVID-19 is a serious thing. We've seen people, multiple people die from it, whether they are young or old. Uh, we've seen people that are, are doing very poorly uh, with this virus. And we know that th this virus is very infectious. Uh, epidemiologists calculate something that they call basic reproductive number. And the basic reproductive number just means that if one person gets the virus, how many people will they transmit the virus to? And we know that the basic reproductive number for COVID-19 is between two to three. So if one person gets the virus, they can transmit it to two or three people. And uh, this, is, uh, this virus is so infectious because scientists believe that it can bind uh, very efficiently to its human receptor. So the human receptor is what we call ACE2, and the virus can bind very efficiently to it. So all you need is a very small infectious dose, and p you can get someone sick. 
We do know that if you sneeze or cough, you can expel up to about 50,000 to 100,000 droplets. And uh, a few of these droplets is what is needed to make someone sick. So this virus is really a serious virus. And I, uh, I do hope that we are all taking it seriously at this point. I know that the order to wear masks in public goes into effect today. We'll be wearing them here at Channel 3. Um, I'm on the air by myself. There's no one in this room, so I don't have to wear it here. But is this a good idea? Do you encourage everyone to wear a mask? And is it okay to just wear um, a covering if you don't have a medical mask? I think it's, okay. it's, it's important that we all uh, uh, wear masks around. Uh, the, the truth about mas mask is that uh, you are preventing uh, the virus from or your droplets from going out to other people. Uh, it's important that we all wear it because we should all behave as though we have the virus. We know that people that are completely asymptomatic can transmit the virus to other people. And so by wearing a mask, you are assuming that you are infected and then you're covering yourself and you're saving other people from getting the virus from you. And that's why I think it's very important that we all wear masks. Is there any new information and, uh, on how to long? To your question? Yeah, is there any new? Uh, to your oh, uh, oh, so, oh, go the, ahead, sorry. To your question about uh, whether we should, which kind of mask that we should be wearing. I, I, I think that what we shouldn't do is to take away the mask that uh, healthcare workers need from them, but we can cover our, our, our faces with any form of cloth or cotton that would prevent the, our droplets from going outside. Yes, we had a wonderful, uh, the wife of one of our promotions managers here, she made us some out of old t-shirts. Uh, we just have cloth coverings here, but just something to have a barrier. Is it still the case that children seem to not be getting this virus, or have you had any new information on that? Uh, that is true. The data that we have from China and the data that we have from CDC as well uh, suggests that children that are younger than 18 years old, it was only about 2% of those uh, that got infected. But we do also know that uh, younger adults between the ages of 18 and 44 are very much at risk and about 20% of our hospitalizations and 12% of ICU care were, uh, uh, were young adults between that age, uh, that age range. People are worried about how long this is gonna last. You study viruses. Is this going to be around for a long time? And yet, how do we see a light at the end of the tunnel? At this point, we don't really know how long this is going to last, but I, oh, I know that there's been suggestions that maybe we may see some reprieve uh, during the summer months, which is very possible because there was a study out of Hong Kong too that suggested that uh, the virus, the transmission rates may relax a little bit during the warmer months, which is very possible. But I think we should all brace ourselves as a community to, be, to deal with this for a very long time. What about the mail and delivery food? Many of us are ordering takeout to try and support the local economy. If you're still getting a paycheck, is this safe to do? I think it's still safe to get mail. Uh, it's still safe to order food. Uh, we, what we should do, though, is that we have to be careful the way we handle the food and not get in contact with people that are delivering the food. So you can let them leave the food on your, uh, on your, uh, on your porch and you can pick it up on your doorway. You can pick it up and clean uh, the, the box or the packaging. Make sure that, that you're wiping it down very well before you unpack, wiping it down, wash your hands before you unpack the food. But overall, I think it's very safe to get mail and to get food. How long, your best guess, we've been seeing different amounts of time, how long does this virus live on surfaces, at least according to the most recent data? So the most recent data that we have suggests that this virus uh, uh, will live for a, a few hours, about three to four hours on copper. Uh, about 24 hours on cardboard and uh, about uh, 72 hours on steel and other surfaces. 
uh, we also do know that uh, after the, the, it depends on the environmental conditions in all of these scenarios. So we can't say this was under an experimental uh, situation. Uh, so we can't say for sure that uh, this, if I, there's a virus on copper, it's just going to last for three hours and I'm fine to go and touch the surfaces without washing out my hand. I, I think that this knowledge is mainly from experimental, uh, as exper from experiments, and we can't just say that that's all that it is, and it's cast in stone that the virus is going to last on, uh, it's going to last 24 hours on cardboard. I, I think at, at the end of the day, it depends on the environmental conditions. Okay. We do know that COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in America. Um, based on the figures right now, there's no other disease that anyone is dying of more right now. So it is something that people need to really pay attention to. One question that people keep asking, I don't know if we have a good answer at this point, is could you get the virus twice? So at this point, uh, the simple answer to that is that we don't know. And uh, most likely you won't get the virus twice, as we already alluded to. Most people will develop uh, immunity, some form of immunity to the virus when they get, uh, the, when they get uh, infected or when they recover from the infection. Uh, and if you have an immunity to it, then most likely you won't have it again. But we don't fully understand how immunity works with uh, SARS uh, COVID-2. Uh, and uh, so I, I would say that at this point, we don't fully understand it. Yes, immunity may last two to three years, just like the original SARS or MERS, and in which case you can't have the illness, uh, you can't have it again until maybe after the, that, that duration. I know we're ending our time with you soon, but I want to ask you, this is allergy season and many of us might be waking up with a sniffle and a headache and wondering, is that allergies or is it COVID-19? How can you tell the difference? Oh, uh, that's a very important question because as you know, we are in allergy season right now. We're getting a lot of questions about that. Uh, what I would say is that, yes, some people can tell the difference between their allergies and upper respiratory tract infections or colds, but in the middle of a pandemic, and a pandemic as serious as COVID-19, I would say that if you are having the sniffles or if you are having any form of respiratory symptoms, including sneezing, coughing, uh, runny nose, sore throat, I think it's very important that you talk to your primary care physician or you talk to your clinician and have them decide together whether you need testing because te getting tested will be very important because then you can isolate yourself and uh, you can prevent spreading the virus to people that you love and people around you. So it's very important that if you're having any of these symptoms to talk to your primary care physician and make the decision together. How, if you know, doctor, how is the testing going right now? Because that's been the problem. We haven't had enough tests or the ability to even get the results back as quickly as people would like. On your, from where you stand, is that getting better? Can more people get the test now? I, I can say that in the hospitals, our testing is getting better and our turnaround time is also getting better. Uh, it's, it's testing in the communities, uh, it's ramping up and people are getting tested. Uh, we are not at the point where we will all be very comfortable with, but what I can say is that it keeps ramping up. Sometimes it takes a while to understand that you might be sick. Maybe you don't have uh, extreme symptoms. I know someone who decided to get tested after a, a decent amount of time after they'd gotten sick. They were feeling better by the time they got tested. Could you have a false negative at that point, or will it pick up that it was in your body? It depends on the test that you get done. If you get a molecular test, which is a test that usually looks for the viral RNA, then uh, depending on the, uh, the, uh, the period of your illness or which, whether you are in the pre-symptomatic or symptomatic or post-symptomatic phase, uh, because you may be shedding virus, that will pick, the molecular test will pick it up. But after about 10 days, people begin to produce antibodies. And uh, if you get an antibody test, it can tell you whether you've 
already been infected with this virus and you've recovered from it. So it depends on the test that you get done, whether it's a molecular test or a, a serology test. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Henry Anyamedo. I know so much information and there's probably even more questions, but we appreciate your time and the new information today. You're always welcome and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you.